Okay, so uh, we'll go to the next, uh, the first slide here. All right, so we're, we are uh, in Bamidbar, and, and I know that the Torah report, we're in the second week of Bamidbar, but I wanted to show you a couple of things as Hebrew word studies the, in the wilderness, and this ties it, ties it all in at the end, so hopefully you'll enjoy it. So it's, uh, in Hebrew is spelled uh, Beit, Mim, Dalit, uh, Beit, Rush, uh, Bamidbar, in, the Beit is in, Midbar is wilderness, and so when you break this down, when you're in the wilderness, it gets wild out there because we, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that in the wilderness, we have the devar, the word. And the word is about our path. And who is giving it to us? It's the sun, the bar, the sun. So just looking at Bamid Bar, that's where the sun can actually get a hold of us, right? We don't have all the distractions, Amazon Prime may not be able to bring us something, <laughs> you know. We, we're actually going to be face to face with the king. I mean, Moses, when he get his instructions on what he was going to do, I mean, he lived in the palace, right? He grew up in Pharaoh's palace with every amenity that you could probably imagine for a king in those days, right? And, but yet, he has his burning bush experience out in the wilderness. You know, Elijah called fire down from heaven, <laughs> Took out 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, con convinced all of Israel to repent and come back. And then one woman, Jezebel, comes after him and he takes off and he runs away, right? But when he's out there in the wilderness, it says he went to Horeb, which is another way of saying Mount Sinai, right? So he's out there and there's this, this earthquake, you know, and his, the voice of the Lord is not in the earthquake. And then there's this mighty rushing wind. You know, his voice isn't there. And then there's fire. So it's like earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> right? The voice of the Lord is not in the earth, wind, and fire. He was in the still, small voice. And that's when the Lord will talk to us when we're out there in the fire. And so Yeshua even got his call where he was tested three times by the adversary. And I believe he got his calling, and that was at the very beginning of his ministry, because if we recall from the New Testament times, the Spirit fell on Yeshua and then led him into the wilderness. And he was there 40 days and 40 nights, so he was good and hungry, good and tired, probably very thirsty, dry. And uh, so there you have it. It's, if you find yourself in the wilderness, you're in good company. <laughs> All right, so he'll be with you even in the fire. So... One other thing I want to show you is the first five books, so if we can go to the next slide. Again, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Hebrew, it's Bereshit, which is in the beginning, right? Shemot is names. Vayikra is he called, and he called. The Bamidbar is in the wilderness, like we just talked about. And Devarim is literally words. So when you put that whole concept together, we go to the next slide, you could say it this way. In the beginning... He knew your name. He called you into covenant. And out in the wilderness, he's going to give you his words. Now, isn't that amazing? Our Lord is alive. All right. Now, that's kind of my Hebrewish stuff that I wanted to share. Okay. Now, I got several calls over the past uh, two weeks or so. There's a spirit of fear that's it's encroaching. Okay, but remember, Hananiah, Azra, Mishael, they were in the fire and the Son of Man was there with them, even though Nebuchadnezzar said seven times hotter, right? Yeshua showed up. So this spirit is like, oh no, are we approaching Armageddon? We have these terrible wars coming up, you know, things are just coming apart in the Middle East. And the next slide has the verse that, that I want to bring to your attention, it says, when the wicked are in authority, the people rejoice. I'm sorry, when the righteous are in authority. People don't rejoice when wicked are in authority. Thanks, honey. I'm looking at the line below it. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, right? But when the wicked man rules, the people groan. And what we see going on is a lot of wickedness and a lot of groaning. And, and what we have is, I'm going to show you this map. Let's take a look at this. Now, this is the Middle East, because when people start talking about Armageddon and Gog of Magog and all this other stuff, right, I just want to put it in context so that you'll know kind of where we are, right, because that's the purpose of the prophets is to help us to understand. And so this is kind of a zoomed out version, 
of essentially North Africa, the Middle East, and, and Russia, and China, and all that, right? Because the next slide shows, when you look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it starts talking about all these different nations. It talks about uh, Togarma and, and uh, you know, all the ones that are from the far north. It says Persia is there with them. The ancient, you know, the, the, the language spoken in the nation of Iran is called Farsi. Farsi is another way of saying Persia, you know, but the, it's like PH, you know, f instead of a hard P, right? So it's talking about Iran. And then we have uh, Libya, which is uh, anciently referred to as Put, and uh, Ethiopia is Kush. And so these nations, while there, there may be animosities, they're not launching rocket attacks and stuff, right? So this, and there's no kings of the east marching across the Euphrates. There's, none, there's nothing, there's no cloud covering the land that the prophet Ezekiel talks about. And so I'm here to tell you, we're not there yet, okay? The days are coming, but we're not there yet. So you can, you can rest a little bit in, in that fact, in my opinion. Now, if you go to the next slide, we'll see that preconditions for this war. And, so, and again, I'm just speaking to you from the Word so that you'll, you'll have an understanding so that you'll have a peace that surpasses normal human understanding. Normal pre-tribulation rapture, normal just every, imminent pulling us out of here, you know, whatever. It's, here's what he says in Ezekiel chapter 38. He says, after many days you'll be visited. And in the latter years you're going to come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountain of Israel which has long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them are dwelling safely. Are all the people who are in covenant with the king of hosts, are they all there dwelling in the land safely? They're still kind of scattered around. I mean, there's, there's more Jewish people on the east coast of the United States than are in the land of Israel right now. I mean, Boca's pretty good, better than Tel Aviv in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> but one day we're coming home. Right, but he says, and you'll say, I'm going to go up against this land of unwalled villages. Now, this is where the Lord is sending this future king. He says, the villages are no walls. There's no extraordinary security matters going on. I'm going to go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty because we've put our faith in the provision instead of the provider. So the Lord has to pull back on it a little bit to make sure he's testing us, right? He says, we're going to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are inhabited and against the people that have been gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Now I'm going to ask you again, has all of Israel been regathered yet? They're not. Jeremiah 3.18 says, together Ephraim and Judah, the house of Ephraim, or the house of Israel and the house of Judah will come together from Eretzaphon, the north country, and they will come into the beautiful land promised to the forefathers. That has not happened yet. Is Israel dwelling in peace safely in the land? Okay. If your news report, I know there's a lot of fake news out there, but even the fake news agrees with this, <laughs> right? There's not a lot of peace going on out there. So just look at any news reports or any modern media, and you'll see that there's a lot going on. So the preconditions for that war that everybody's so worried about have not been met. The nations that are involved with the conflicts today are not involved in the one that this prophecy is talking about. So we're not there. So there's no reason to have this spirit of fear about all these things. Okay. In another picture, let's go to the next slide. Cities with no bars, no walls, no gates, dwelling safely in the midst of the land. These are scenes from the biblical city Hebron. Hebron is an amazing place from a biblical perspective. It's where Caleb, at, in his ripe young age of 80-ish, <laughs> went up the hill to take out the, Philistine, the Philistines or the you know, Philistines of, of the day, right? And that's where you get this phrase, it was an uphill battle. And Caleb took it because he was wholehearted because Caleb is a dog, which is a wholehearted animal, and, and it's the hand of the heart, right? He had the heart of Daniel. And he took that mountain. But today, it's walled off. There's signs if you're driving into that area, to the old synagogue, I've seen it because a friend of mine was actually sounding a shofar there recently. And uh, with, a, with a large contingent of IDF people. <laughs> um, and it says, Jews forbidden. It's illegal to come here. Okay, so if we're supposed to be dwelling safely in the land, then why can't we go to Hebron, one of the greatest historical cities in the Holy Land, right? 
So we have a lot of unfulfilled prophecies. Now, on the next, but the, all hope is not lost, right? So let's take a look at the next slide. Now, this is the current status of what I'm calling, or what's referred to as the Abraham Accords, okay? And this is a, a, very, a very nice way to say, look, can we just at least have normal relations with our neighbors? Okay, that's the whole purpose. It's just like the United States come into agreement with Cuba on something. It doesn't necessarily mean we agree with everything the Cubans do and they don't agree with everything we do. It just means we're probably not going to shoot at each other. And maybe our people can go down to Havana and go to the beach. And maybe your folks can come on up here and go to New York City or come out to East Tennessee and go fly fishing. I don't know. I mean, you know, let's, let's just have normal relations with one another. It's not, it's not a covenant with death. Okay, we're going to talk about what Daniel had to say because today's message is about the heart of Daniel. Yeah. But, the, but there's these five nations that are involved in these uh, uh, arrangements. Morocco is one of them. Uh, Sudan is another one. Bahrain, you can't even see it. I've got a little arrow pointed to it. It's this tiny little island. I was looking at the maps of Bahrain this morning. <laughs> And it's a beautiful little island with like resorts and restaurants. And it's, it's actually, it looks like a pretty cool place to go. If you lived in the land of Israel and you could hop on a, I guess you call it a Southeast flight <laughs> instead of a Southwest flight, just jump over to Bahrain and spend the weekend with your bride, you know, and maybe the Bahrain people could come over and look at some holy sites. You know, don't, that would be kind of a nice thing, right? Yeah. And, and we see the United Arab Emirates is on there as well as Oman. None of these nations, none of them are involved in the war that we're, we read about in Ezekiel. Isn't that interesting? So that's not the covenant of death. This, this is actually just getting along with your neighbors. And Yeshua tells us we're supposed to love our neighbors, right? So that's being patient with them. That means being kind to them, trying to figure out how we can work together. So, so these are, this is a, a nations, or this is a, a map of those nations, right? So now... If you take a look at Ezekiel, I wanted to map this out because I saw this pattern. This is the end times pattern according to the prophet Ezekiel. And it starts on the, ne on the next slide. It starts in Ezekiel chapter 33, and maybe you can appreciate why I started here. Because Ezekiel warns us to not be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. <laughs> he says, my people are just listening and they hear all this stuff and then they don't go home and implement anything, right? The New Testament warns us, you know, don't be hearers of the word, also be doers. And then we see in Ezekiel 34 that there's judgment on the wicked shepherds because the wicked shepherds are giving the people the idea that you can just be a hearer and not a doer. <laughs> or they might say you can be a doer and that overcomes everything else. You don't have to have that faith. You see, Yeshua tells us the saints have the faith of Yeshua, the faith in Yeshua, the Messiah, who Daniel also tells us who he is and when he came. And we're going to look at that in just a second. Okay. But he also says that we have to, we, we, we are willingly enjoying being a part of this marriage covenant with our heavenly father. And we're doing things according to his covenant just because we can't help it. <laughs> it's not legalistic compliance at all. It's joyful obedience because we want a successful relationship with him. It's like wearing my wedding ring. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm Amanda's husband. <laughs> you know, if I take it off, what's she going to be thinking? She might be thinking I'm doing concrete or something. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So then we see the judgment on the wicked shepherds comes. And then in Ezekiel 35, and this is where it starts getting more specific. Because I think we're right in this area between two and three. Because I'm, I'm seeing COVID has wiped out a lot of churches. Okay. There, there's a lot of ministries that, that had a lot of steam. But lately, it's, you know, over the past year or so, it's, this one's thriving. It's because we worship in spirit and truth. Okay, you got to have both. You get spirit only, you're going to burn out. You get truth only, you're dead. <laughs> you got to have both. Be on fire for the Lord and do it His way. And get it set in our hearts. And I love how Matthew is always encouraging us this way, right? But we see in Ezekiel 35 that there's this judgment on uh, Mount Seir. And Mount Seir is also referenced... Uh, the, one of the things that they talk about is this ancient hatred that this, the people of Seir have for the people of Israel. And Psalm 83 specifies all those nations. We're going to look at a few maps here in just a second. But then after this conflict is dealt with, with Seir and the judgment that's poured out on Seir, we see that Ezekiel tells us that there's a blessing 
and a restoration on the house of Israel. And this is the whole house of Israel. And he goes in and details it out. He says, the dry bones are going to come to life and you're going to get up out of your graves. And then you're going to know that I'm Yahweh when you come up out of your graves. It's so clear he's telling us that there's going to be a massive resurrection. Okay? And then he says, I'm, going to not, I'm not going to just resurrect you from the dead. I'm going to pour out my spirit on you. And I'm going to cause you to want to walk in my statutes and my ways. And then that's when you're really going to be filled with the spirit. <laughs> Because there's going to be nothing holding you back. And then he says, now I've got these two sticks, these dead sticks, but now they're coming back to life again. I'm like, I'm transplanting them and I'm putting them home in the mountains of Israel where I always wanted them to be in the first place. And they're going to be one kingdom. There's going to be one king over them. And there would be one people. And they're going to be in the land. And this is the great, but, but see that war, this, this Psalm 83 conflict is what does, it accomplishes what we're not quite there yet on. Because there's prophecy that says the house of Judah will no longer harass the house of Israel and the house of Israel will no longer be jealous or envious of Judah. And at least in my heart, I consider myself probably more aligned with the house of Israel. And I'm really not envious of Judah. I'm, I'm hopeful for our brother. I'm ready to come home. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of eating in the pig trough, right? I don't want to take anything from them. When you're jealous or envious, you want to take. I want to participate. I'm here to help, <laughs> right? But one day, Judah will no longer harass us. Because <laughs> right now, they don't trust us, and I can't blame them. There's a lot of history there, okay? But the Lord is going to make a little shift and then we're going to come together. So if we just set it in our hearts to do our part, then we're going to trust that he's going to pull it all together. And sadly, I think that this war is the one that's going to do the trick. Because Judah's hearts are going to be broken because while they win the war, it's going to be very difficult on them to the point where they may not even be sure they'd survive it. And then we're going to look at our brothers and we're going to let they need us. And they were like, we need, please come help. And we're like, we're here to help. And then we're going to together rebuild Amen. the land. But then, like I said, we start getting, you start doing obedience, you get blessed by the Lord. That's a promise in the Torah. So the blessings start coming. And then our heart starts changing again. <laughs> this is the pattern that we see in Israel. We start getting... You know, excited about all the stuff we have and the beachfront property and we, we now can get a, a, a condo in um, the Gaza Strip and get them greenhouses going again that was destroyed back in 19 whenever it was. Okay? So then the Lord has to do the ultimate test by sending the Gog of Magog guy to come in. And that's when we see the whore will stay in bed with him but then the harlot, I mean, the, the, the bride, the pure bride says, you know what? I'm going out in the wilderness. I need to hear from the sun. And the sun already told us that's where we have to go. And then after that war, that's when the kingdom of Israel is fully restored. And then Yeshua will be ruling and reigning. So I just wanted to give, this is, when I look at Ezekiel, this is the end times. So should you be living in a spirit of fear right now? Not according to the prophets. We should be seeking the Lord and like, what do I need to change? And what attitudes do I need to correct? And how can I love better? And what do I need to do to get ready for the trip? <laughs> right? And what can I do to prepare the youth? Because they might be leading us out there. He says a little child's going to lead them. I'm going to follow this little child if he's going to. If he says, hey, Kev, let's go to this. I'm like, okay, got a ticket. I'm going. Let's go. <laughs> Especially if it's in the mountains. <laughs> so maybe that's why the Lord's bringing so many people here so we can get in shape. <laughs> And learn how to get around in these mountains. So this is the overview from the book of Ezekiel. But this is not even my whole message. <laughs> now here's the next slide. It shows uh, Psalm 83. So this is what I, where I think we are. I'm, if I'm assessing the situation, this is where I believe we're at right now. And this is Asaph, the prophet Asaph. He says, do not keep silent, O Elohim, and do not hold your peace. Do not be still, O Elohim. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. Okay, they've lifted up their head like a cobra, like a serpent. They've taken crafty counsel. Again, that's, that's serpent language. The devil is crafty, and he deceived the woman, and she ate, and she gave some to her husband, right? He's crafty. He's tricky, right? They've come against your people, and they've cons consulted together against your sheltered ones, and they've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent and they form a confederacy 
against you. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, and Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, and also Assyria has joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot. So that lists all the nations. We're going to look at a map here in just a second, right? But then the prophet says, deal with them as you did with Midian, and as with Sisera, and as with Yavin at the brook of Kishon, who perished at Endor, became like refuse on the earth. Do you remember what Sisera did when Yael did to, to Sisera? Tent peg in the head, right? And that's what the prophet is saying. Do that to these leaders who are rising up their head against you, Lord. He's asking for judgment. He's asking for, you know, deliverance. But he says, make their nobles like Oreb and Zaib and their princes like Zavah and Zalmunna, who say, let us take for ourselves the pasture of Elohim for a possession. It's a one-state solution. They want all. Okay? So, O oh, my Elohim, make them like a whirling dust. And like chaff before the wind as fire burns in the woods and the flame sets them mountains on fire. And so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm and fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Yahweh. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish that they may know you whose name alone is Yahweh are most high over all the earth. Now, these symbols that I have on here, I have them up here for educational purposes. Okay. This is called the, the Inshallah. This is an Islamic seal. You'll see it if you ever went to a synagogue, or not a synagogue, but a, a mosque, or a lot, a lot of the places where they have this. And this is the word of what they call Allah, which in Hebrew is translated as curse. And this is the sad, the crafty devil's got people worshiping a curse. And, and that's, that is sad. And these are our cousins, right? These are descendants of Abraham. And so the Lord has a place in his heart for them. Is, uh, you know, Exodus, I think it's Exodus or Genesis 36 has the whole genealogy of, of Edom and, and the Ishmaelites. I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? And so, but isn't it amazing that this, this word, Allah here, which has that kind of that stick that goes up like this and then it has this squiggly looking thing. It kind of looks like a tree, a big cedar of Lebanon, <laughs> if you will. And then there's like this snake right there and it has a crown on top of it. Isn't it very interesting that, that it's like this king snake with a tree is how the thing physically looks in their language. I mean, this is the deception that we're dealing with. And, and the Bible is very clear. It says, in the end of days, those who hate him love death. And they'll think that they're doing him a favor by killing you. Right? So this is the mindset. This is why we have to pray against it. We have to overcome with love. And this is hard to do. But that's what our Messiah did. Amen. All right. And so looking at the maps of the nations, Psalm 83, I've kind of had this. This is uh, Rose Publishing has some of these ancient lands. And so you got the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, Moabites, all, all of them have these blue lines showing where all they are. And if you go to the next slide, it shows the modern nations. We're talking about Jordan. We're talking about Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Gaza Strip, the Hamas in the Gaza, which, by the way, Hamas in Hebrew means violence. How are you supposed to make peace with violence? But why would you name your political party called violence when you know how you're, you're telling everybody who, you're, who you are? And it says that the inhabitants of, of Tyre, I had a friend who was from Tyre. Uh, his name was Bassam. And uh, he's from Lebanon. And also Assyria has joined them, right? And so again, these are the nations. None of these nations currently have any of these Abraham Accords. None of these nations are around for the Ezekiel 38 war. So that says something happened to them. All right. He says, come, let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And they said, let us take for ourselves a possession for, uh, you know, for, of Elohim for a possession. They want to take it over, right? But it's not theirs to take. It's his. So... He's going to bring a tempest. He's going to bring a storm. And this means war. But here's the thing. When you also read Ezekiel, when he says that he's giving out his spirit, he says he pours out his spirit with, his spirit with wrath. So when there's a time of war, he also says, I gotta have, now my people are ready to operate. I'm going to pour out my spirit on them so they can do the miraculous healing. So they can get in there and say the word. So they can slip through the crowd like my son Yeshua did. And they can go right to that person and take care of that person. And it's, it's, a, it's going to be amazing what, what the Lord will do. But it comes when it's necessary, not early, but when it's really necessary. And then we hope that there will be a lot of laborers, that they won't be few. 
So again, if we look at the, at the summary, again, this is a defensive war. It's in Israel t- in response to attack by their enemy nations. We have a lot of believing brothers and sisters over there, okay? There's, there's Messianic Jews and there's Arab Christians yeah. all throughout this land. And, and the, I'll, I'll tell you one little story about one, one of the guys. He's amazing. He's, he, he's a, he, I, I don't know if his family was a Muslim, but he was Arab, okay? And he, and he lived in America, and his dad, he wanted to honor his father. And he had made a pledge to the Lord, because this guy was a Christian. He says, Lord, I'm not going to marry. I'm making a vow to you. I'm not going to get married to any woman unless you bring her to me. He made a vow to the Lord. And months go by, no woman, he's, he's okay, he's a comedian, he's kind of funny. Well, then his dad says, son, I need you to go to, to Gaza Strip. We have family over there, and they're kind of in trouble. And he's like, I don't want to go to Gaza, the Hamas is there, they want to behead me, you know, I'm an infidel as far as they're concerned, I'm worse than one who never believed, uh, they think I've turned my back, and he goes, how can I do this? But he says, I had to honor my father. So he, he makes the trip to Israel, he crosses the border, he goes down into Gaza, which is a pretty risky thing to do. And he gets invited to this person's house for dinner, and he goes to the dinner, and there's a woman there, and, and they all know he's Christian because his family's told everybody. And, and he's like, are they gonna kill me? What am I doing here at the dinner? And she said, she said well, I'm glad you're here, I'm a Christian. And he goes, I think you're my wife. (laughs) And you know, she said, let me pray about that. She fasted and prayed for three days. They left on the fourth day. They got married and they have a fruitful marriage to this day. So this Arab Christian who honored his father by going to Muslim dominated Hamas, one of the most dangerous places on earth for a Christian, and he finds his wife. How many Christians are in Gaza? Enough, enough to matter, right? So that's why, that's our brothers and sisters over there, right? So we have to have this this heart. So I just wanted to share. So this is, I'm not celebrating the destruction because the Lord does not delight in the destruction of the wicked. He wants all to repent and come into covenant and get on his plan because we heard earlier, I think it was our sister said that that his house is gonna be a house of prayer for all nations. Not just some of them. Not just the ones we don't like. Not the ones that take their shoes off before they enter the building. All of them. Right? So, but again, their respective societies, Arab Christians and Messianic Jews, frequently are prevented from being able to be the bridge of peace that I believe that the Lord is calling them to be in the land today. And so, uh, many are going to suffer on all sides, and so there's no joy in this message but I do think it's part of the birth pains, and I think it's what prepares the way for us to, to move into where he's going with this. So, a heart like Daniel, if we want to do this. Now, when Matthew asked me to do this teaching, the, immediately I was like, book of Daniel. And I was like, okay. And, and I set my mind to, to read, so, and I read very slowly, like one chapter a day. And, and I was looking at all the little details, like, did you know that when... Um, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, when, the, when it says that the hand appeared and it had fingers on the hand, I, never, I always thought it was just a finger. It was a hand with fingers, multiple fingers, and it's writing on the wall, and it says that his knees were knocking and that his hip got loose. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, Jacob, he got touched on the hip. When the Lord's trying to get through to us, he might cause us to have a little problem in our hip. And Craig lindsay has been helping me out with my hip problem. <laughs> but I will tell you, it's the little details that are in there that let you know there's continuity in the message. So, so the two things that, this is the whole outline of Daniel, right? There's obedience and exile. How do we obey the king while we're kicked out of the land? This is the model that we get from the book of Daniel. And in spite of this, you know, we see Daniel and his people serving the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's interpreting their dreams. He's encouraging them. They're doing all these things. And then ultimately it's perverted into this weird message where, where the king has this vision and Daniel interprets the vision and everybody's all excited about that. And the vision has like this statue and it's got a head of gold and chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze and legs of iron and feet iron and miry clay. And then Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel goes to tell him all these are different kingdoms that are going to come in the future. And yours, you're that golden head. 
And I, and, he, and I think after some time goes by, Nebuchadnezzar goes and says, I ain't just the golden head, I'm the whole thing. So he makes one great big gold statue. He defies the vision that the Lord gave him, right? And he, now he tell, forces everybody to bow down and worship this thing, right? They can play all kinds of music. I don't think it's like Sharon and Nate and you know, what, what you guys are doing and, and the amazing, loving it, loving it. So all of, all of that, they were supposed to bow down in front of this idol. And so we see that Nebuchadnezzar, though, is judged because he does have a call. He's supposed to be this king of Babylon. And then he ultimately repents after seven years because the, the gifts and call of the Lord are without repentance, right? He called Nebuchadnezzar to be that guy, right? But then Daniel's promoted as a result. And then we see Belshazzar's party, right, where he's having all these temple articles and he brings them in and they're having this, and he says he's drinking wine in front of everybody. And what's really interesting, I, I discovered about this when I was looking into it, was that it says that he was there with all of his, uh, the governors and the satraps and all these important people. And it says in his wives and his concubines. And then that's when the hands appear. So this guy had his whole entourage. And then when the thing appeared, when the hand appeared with the fingers, with the writing, mini, mini, tekel, ufarsim, you know, you've been weighed, you've been found wanting. Now your kingdom is divided. The Medes and Persians are taken over, right? But it was his wife, the queen, she came into this party. It was like Queen Vashti from the days of Esther where she wasn't a part of this party that was going on. And, and so the queen came and she said, you know, there's a guy in your kingdom that interprets dreams. Maybe you should go talk to him. And then she, presumably she left. So like there's this righteous queen in there. I can't figure her out yet. But if anybody has insights on that, let me know. But I, I saw her as being a lot like Vi Queen Vashti, taken advantage of by the king. But nevertheless, we see that Daniel brings the interpretation. Then we see that, that uh, the Medes usurp the kingdom. And then we see Daniel praying to the Lord, and they come up with this scheme to get Daniel to not pray. And they catch him praying. So they throw him in the lion's den. And even in the fire, the Lord of hosts was with him, right? He did, the, the Lord shut up the mouths of the lions. And then Daniel comes out of there, and the king rejoices because he really did, he got trapped into a bad decision, right? And then Daniel starts having visions, right? Some really good ones, and we're going to talk specifically about one of them here in just a second. But Gabriel, this angel, this messenger from heaven, gives the interpretation to Daniel because Daniel was so vexed by these dreams, he was like, he said he couldn't even get up. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a pretty heavy dream, right? And then, as soon as he gives the interpretation to understand what's going on, the first thing Daniel does is he sets his mind and he starts repenting for his own sin and for the sin of all of Israel. This is the heart of Daniel. When he understands the plan, he gets real concerned about the family because he knows that one day the kingdom is going to be restored. Amen. And that's his priority. Amen. He wants to go home. He had it good in Babylon, as good as you could have it, third in command but he wanted to go home. So this should be our heart. Now he gives us the 77's prophecy, which we're going to dive into a little bit. And then after he gets this prophecy, he gets a vision of the King of Glory. I believe he saw Yeshua, just like Ezekiel chapter 1 sees Yeshua, just like John saw Yeshua, and just like all the Ancient of Days and all the, the wheels within a wheel and the, and the seraphim and the cherubim and every other warring angel that's out there and the lightnings and the thunder, we see all of this going on. And then he gets a little bit more details about the kingdom of Persia, Greece, this battles that goes on between the kings of the north and south, and then finally an end times prophecy. So this is the outline of Daniel. But I wanted to specifically talk about the 77s because there's a movement, there's a spirit of Antichrist that was working in the days of Yeshua the Messiah, and it's working today. Okay? And it's, it's basically anything that would cast doubt on who he is, what his role is, his ministry. Do we even need him because we got the Torah now? Or what, you know, there's a lot of craziness and mindsets. And so I want to help set the record straight for our king. Amen. Now, here's Daniel. Remember, this is after he got all these visions and all this stuff. And he's, he says, while I was praying and speaking and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before Yahweh. Okay, he's pouring his heart out to the Lord. My Elohim for the, my holy mountain of my Elohim. And yes, I was speaking in prayer and the man Gabriel who had, I had seen in the vision at the beginning caused to fly swiftly, reached out to me about the 
time of the evening offering. When was Yeshua put to death? It's about the time of the evening offering. Interesting. And he informed me and he talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I've come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you because you are greatly beloved. When you start interceding with your whole heart for your people in this and other everywhere else, you're beloved of the Lord. When you get on board with his plan and you're ready to advance it and you're going to do whatever it takes and you're going to forsake it all, now he's like, Ah, that's my boy. That's my girl. Right? Therefore, consider matter and understand the vision. So now he's explaining it. He says these six things are going to be accomplished throughout this prophetic. He's giving him the whole picture. He says we're going to finish transgression. We're going to put an end of sin. And that doesn't mean getting rid of the Torah. That means getting rid of the sin. <laughs> right? That means we're going, to, we're going to have reconciliation for iniquity. We're going to bring in everlasting righteousness. We're going to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. And so he says, So know and therefore understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, now this is all about the restoration of a land that had been destroyed by war. The Babylonians sieged the place. Probably been to Masada. <laughs> right? Until Messiah the prince... There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and the street will be built again and the wall, even in troubled times. So when it's time to rebuild, it's not easy. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who, will, who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it will be with a flood until the end of the war of desolations are determined. And then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolator, or the one who makes desolate. Okay, so let's, let's take a quick look at this. And I want to point out, Daniel says the Messiah is going to be cut off. And that's another way of saying killed. <laughs> and here it is in Hebrew. On the next slide, I've got it circled. Mem, Shem, Yod, Chet, Mashiach. He uses the same exact word twice. The Mashiach will be cut off. So Daniel is talking about a very specific Messiah, and he's going to get cut off at a very specific time. It was after the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. There's going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens. And after the 62, that's when that Messiah is going to get cut off. That's what Daniel said. He's very specific. So... Let's do a little searching. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2. The whole thing with Ezra and Nehemiah is about the end of the Babylonian captivity, and they're ready to come home and rebuild the city. And so it came to pass in the month of Nisan. What happens in Nisan? Passover. Passover unleavened bread, first fruits, right? First Exodus. Second Exodus, possibly. <laughs> Got to go home and rebuild it somehow. <laughs> Now, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I have never been sad in the presence of the king before. See, when you're in front of a king, you don't bring your personal problems in your baggage. You serve in the king. You can do that on your own time. <laughs> right? You're standing in front of the king. It's about the king, not about you or not about me. You, you see what I'm saying? So he said to me, Why is your face sad? And why are you not? Why, are you sick? Is... is is, there's nothing but sorrow of heart. I, I, you're really downtrodden here. What's going on? And so I became dreadfully afraid because he's like, oh, no, the king knows that I've dishonored him by showing this, right? And he says, I've, uh, um, may the king live forever. <laughs> See, he has grace speaking to the pagan king, even though he wants to go home. This is, this is his attitude, right? Why? He says, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad, though, when I think... When the city, my place of my father's tomb, lies in waste and the gates are burned with fire. He's stirred up because his land is destroyed where he came from. And the king said to me, well, what do you want? What do you request? What do you want me to do? And he says, well, so I prayed to the Elohim of heaven and I said to the king, See, if we don't know what to do, just pray. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a sermon right there on its own. If we just don't know what, just Lord, what am I supposed to say to this guy? <laughs> I want to go home. 
right? He says, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, and the queen was right there with him, how long is your journey going to be? When are you coming back? We like you, <laughs> right? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set a time. And furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me, the governors of the rain, uh, um, a region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber. So to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which relates to the city, uh, to the temple for the city wall, for the house and for the house that I'm going to live in, I'm going to occupy it. And the king granted them to me, the two letters. He asked for two letters from the king, a decree, a written decree from the king, right? According to the good hand of my Elohim has put on me. And so this says he went to the governors into the region beyond the river and he gave them the king's letters. And now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with him. He's like, they're not going to think this is a forgery. I'm going to send my own military guys to escort him in case they got questions. Right? So now they show up and when Sunbalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite our official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being well of the children of Israel. And so you see, they, he had the decree to rebuild the city. When did this occur? In this first verse, it says it was the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So, let's dig further. Artaxerxes I of Persia. This is on Wikipedia. Not even a Christian source. Not even Hebraic. Artaxerxes I of Persia, whose rule is through Arta, which is truth, Hebrew, they give his name as Zaharis. Um, and it goes on to say he was the fifth of the kings of the Achaemenid Empire, or the, you know, the um, Medo-Persian. And he reigned from 465 B.C. to 424 B.C. And he was the third son of Xerxes I. Now, if his reign started at 465 B.C., and this proclamation came out in the 20th year of his reign, when was the two letters given? 445 B.C. That's good. Somebody's a math major. I like that. Okay, so now there's your, there's your line right there. That's when the decree was went out according to the Bible. Now, he says there's going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens, and after the 62 sevens, the Messiah is going to what? He's going to be cut off. So, again, just do some math. Maybe this is why Hebrews are so good at computer programming. <laughs> they can do the math. 7 and 62 is 69, but that's one year. We'll multiply that by 7 to get the weeks of years. It's 483 years. And when you add 483 years to the 445 B.C., but you have to subtract year zero because it doesn't count. <laughs> there was no year zero. You end up at 30 A.D. 30 is when the Messiah comes. He's answering your prayers. Okay. But he's cut off. So we'll look at the next one, the next slide. So you see Daniel is very specific that there was a Messiah that was going to be cut off from his people at the, at the end of that period of time. Now we've got a calendar on the next slide if it catches up. <laughs> so we take a look at the calendar in the year 30 A.D., which was actually the Julian calendar at the time. They didn't convert over to the Pope Gregory's calendar until much later when they realized Easter wasn't getting adjusted right. <laughs> So they had to make a couple of more leap year modifications. But in these days, it was the Julius Caesar, Julian calendar. So what you see, if you go back to the year 30, if you look at the new moon crescent, if it was seen on the evening of March 22nd in 30 AD, then that would have meant that day one of Nisan on that year would have been March 30th, or Mar March uh, 23rd, right, on the calendar, right? Because the calendar starts at sunset the day before, right? And so when you look at the math, what you'll see is that that would put day 10, Lamb Inspection Day, on Shabbat, April 1st, April Fool's Day. Interesting. My wife was born on that day, the day when the lamb came riding in on a donkey. Yeah. Day 14, which would have been Passover, would have been Wednesday that year, April 5th, 30 A.D., what if Passover's on a Wednesday? Did anybody listen to Matthew Miller's explanation of calendar issues? 
if Passover is on Wednesday, you have a prophecy that says after three days and three nights, he would be in the tomb, right? Yeshua gave, said, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. And as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the dog gadol, the great fish, for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be, right? So Yeshua is buried. He's put to death and buried on Wednesday, right? So you got Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. There's your three nights. And you have Thursday day, Friday day, and Saturday day. There's your three days. But wait a minute. I thought he was supposed to rise on the third day. How is that possible? Because it's the third day of unleavened bread. The third day of Hag Hamatzot. It's not just any old third day. If you look at the calendar, that Shabbat would have been the day he would have risen from the dead. And people don't discover that until they're done with Shabbat and they go out early Sunday morning while it's still dark to go out there to anoint the body and, whoa, he's gone. Well, that's because he rose from the grave at probably at the time of the evening sacrifice on Shabbat when nobody was out at grave sites because they're supposed to be at home resting or in the temple worshiping. And so... First fruits would have been that April 9th, which would have been the fourth day of unleavened bread, but the, the tomb was empty by then. So the bottom line is this, and I'm telling you these things because you need to understand Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, according to the prophecies. He's part of the tribe of Judah, according to the genealogies. He was raised in Nazareth. <laughs> he passed all the tests of Torah. Every one of them. He never sinned. He demonstrated signs and wonders and miracles, even the restoration of sight to the blind. And King David says, open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things hidden in your Torah. Because the Messiah is the one who opens up our eyes. And one day he's going to open up our eyes and those scales are going to come off. And our brother Judah is going to see the one that's been pierced and they're going to mourn for him. And we're going to be like, we made him look like this Egyptian guy that you didn't recognize. And he's not Roman. He's, he's the Jewish Messiah. And hallelujah, we're here to worship him. On his terms. <laughs> and so... He fulfilled all these prophecies. He acted out and gave numerous specific prophecies that himself came true, and many have yet to be fulfilled. And Daniel accurately predicted the exact date of the Messiah some 500 years before it happened. So my question that I want to plant in your mind is this. If Yeshua of Nazareth that's written about in the New Testament is not the Messiah that Daniel was talking about, then who is because if he's not, then that means Daniel's a false prophet. But how can a false prophet be false when everything he says keeps coming true? Amen. When everything about him is his heart for the people, a heart for the land, a heart to return to the ways of the Lord and to give up a good life in Babylon, a very wealthy man he was. And I'll tell you what I think also about Daniel. I love Daniel. Because Daniel had all this money, right, if you think about it, because he was offered a gold chain if he could just interpret the, the vision with the hand and the fingers. He said, I don't need any gold chains. This one's on the house. The Lord has shown me. He didn't need that gold. He had enough. And he knew when the Messiah was coming. He knew where the Messiah was coming. And he was in charge of all the wise men from the east. In the New Testament, they're called magi. Where do you think those guys got gold, frankincense, and myrrh? They came from the east. They were Daniel's boys. Amen. Yeah. Because Daniel probably gave them his treasure and said, this is for the Messiah, because he knew that King Herod would be coming after him because there was another prophecy that says, out of Egypt I'm called my son. And he knew they would be hightailing it down to Cairo to get away from Herod. Yes. Yeah. So if we find ourselves <laughs> with a lot of money and not sure what to do, <laughs> uh, he said pray <laughs> and find out. Because like in the days of Daniel, it was stored up for the Messiah. Yeah. So the question now is, who is the he in the Daniel 9 prophecy? And I want to offer something very interesting perspective because I hear so many people saying, when Israel makes a peace agreement, they're making a covenant with death and they're the Antichrist. And then we're all going to get raptured out of here and then them Jews are going to pay the price. You know, no, he, he is the Messiah and he will be cut off. Okay. And he will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven because Daniel has 70 sevens. And all the prophecies about Daniel about this timeline relate to the Messiah. 
There's seven sevens and 62 sevens. The Messiah is going to be cut off. And at the 77, it's all, it's all about the Messiah. And the last time I checked, the devil's the one breaking covenants. The Messiah is the one creating them and establishing them. We have a covenant with Adam. Be fruitful and multiply. We have a covenant with Noah. I'm never going to bring a flood again. We got a covenant with Abraham. Your seed are going to be, you know, all that you're going to be the father of many nations. Amen. Isaac, Jacob, your, your people are coming back to this land. Yes. You know, and then we, we just, he's make covenant after covenant after covenant after covenant after covenant. And then he confirms his covenant with the many for one seven. So the question is, is what is the confirmation of the covenant? I'll submit to you this in Revelation 11, 3. Yeshua says, I'm going to give my power to my two witnesses. Another way of confirming a covenant is to strengthen it. How do you strengthen something? You give it power. The two witnesses get the power. They're there rebuilding, just like in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. They are rebuilding the temple. The two witnesses, anybody who comes against them, they're going to pay the price that... The 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah got fire from heaven, right? Because the Lord is confirming his covenant with fire from heaven, if that's what it takes. And if our hearts are right, we should be there with them. Now, Deuteronomy 19, 15, it says, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or sin that he commits, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter is established. It is confirmed. I got two witnesses right there. Putting, I'm putting my money on the two witnesses yeah. as being a confirmation of the covenant, and it's all about restoration of the kingdom. Yes. But that doesn't make Antichrist too happy because he is, of, he is the prince who is of the people who will come that destroyed the sanctuary. Now, you can say that's the Romans because it was the Roman Empire. And there's a lot of people that say that. And it is possible. But there's also, Romans had divisions. And the Romans had a very vast kingdom. And just like the United States, I mean, there's. would you say that there's a difference between people in Tennessee and maybe California? Yes. Yes. I love my Californian brothers and sisters. They have it harder there than we do here. <laughs> but there's a difference. What I'm saying is this. We're united, just like the Roman Empire was united. But are they ethnic... Romans. If you look at it, you'll find that there are certain divisions that were actually of us from Assyria. They were part of the Roman Empire, but they were Assyrians. And this is the Assyrian that comes and boards, he tramples on our borders. So what we see is in the middle of the week, the, the people of the prince who will come are destroying it. That means the prince who's coming is the Assyrian. Okay? And he puts an end to the uh, sacrifice and offering. What is the first line of business that he does? He kills the two witnesses. He tries to cut off the covenant that had just been confirmed. And then he gets to rule and reign for 42 months because he let these dead bodies go around in the streets for three and a half days. And it's the day for your principle. So for 42 months, this dude gets his bowls and seals and thunders and everything poured out on his head because the Lord is going to cleanse his house, because the Lord is not inconsistent. He says the house that has the idols in it is set for destruction. Yeah. That means even his own house. Yeah. So if your house has idols in it, I would encourage you to have a heart like Daniel. <laughs> Get them out of there, man. We don't want our houses destroyed. We want our houses to be places of blessing. Yeah. So get determined about that. And Yeshua says in Revelation eleven seven, 7, right, when they finish their testimony, to mind the two witnesses, that the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. That's, that's, he, he finally puts an end to it. And then Yeshua tells us, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that great big statue standing in the holy place, whoever reads it, let him understand, let all those who are in Judea flee to the mountains because the Lord is going to cleanse his house and we're not intended to be destroyed. It's better to go out into the wilderness with our Messiah and to hear his word and be like David who gave up life in this palace with King Saul to go out when he's on the run from Absalom, he's out in the wilderness. Uh, we have so many examples in Scripture from that. So again, we tie it back. Last slide. In the wilderness, Bamidbar, which is where we're studying the Torah right now, that's where we'll get a word about our path.
from the sun. And so don't be afraid of the wilderness. We're going to be out there together. Shabbat Shalom.